Good evening, church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Colin, the pulpit minister here at Central Church of Christ. And this is Dan Spaeth. He's one of our elders. And here at Central Church of Christ, it's our mission to be God's heart and hands in this community and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about what that means, I want to encourage you to head over to our website at www.churchvictoria.com. This is our Wednesday evening conversation through the law and the prophets where we open up the Old Testament. We move through the narrative and the text and we see how it impacts us today as the church and how it how that text connects to Jesus. Um, if you're listening Listening to this on the Heart and Heads podcast. I want to thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you have the bell turned on so you get notified every time we upload a video. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure to like and share. That really helps us out. And make sure to comment down below. Um, if this ministry has blessed you or you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, I want, I want to encourage you to head over to that website. At the top of the page, we have a donate button that uh, take, will take you to PayPal, and you can partner with us as we seek to teach and preach the gospel. Uh, we're going to pray and get into the lesson. Again, church, thank you so much for joining us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to sit down and study. We pray your blessings upon all of us as we as we navigate this text. We pray for our audience, Father, that they will learn and grow and that Cole and I will be able to present these things in a way that they can understand. Father, we thank you for the power of the word. We thank you for the power of your son and the power of the Holy Spirit that uh, that you have blessed us with and given to us as a down payment. Father, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. Bless us, Father, today as we study, and help us, Father, to learn the things that we need to learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're we're finally skipping some chapters today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we Numbers... Just, we decided by mutual consent. <laughs> so Numbers 7 uh, is, is, is a lot of what you're seeing. It's very repetitive, but it's, it's where the tribes come in and uh, the leaders of the tribes come in and assist and not assist but join in the anointing of the altar in the tabernacle yeah and so that's what's going on and of course god is ordering all of this god is giving them the direction well, and all he's of this. getting them ready to leave that's right yeah absolutely. and and they're, they're gonna there's gonna be a long journey involved anytime you go on a journey you got preparations you got to make i mean we're going you know that after when they see this we've already done this but we're going to the lake tomorrow and uh, and there's got a lot man i've been working on this for all week yeah making sure everything's bought, making sure we got everything, making sure we figured out how we're going to do this and this. There's preparations that have to be made. You know, no matter what you, y'all went to the lake, I mean, to down to the beach, mm -hmm. and y'all made preparations. I'm sure for a week ahead of time you were you were making preparations. You had all these kids. You got to get things packed, and then you unpack and pack again. Well, that's what God's doing here, yeah. getting them ready to leave. And, uh, and part of it is, the big part of it is going to be that everything they do is going to revolve around their worship. It's going to be, it, it revolves around God, at least it's supposed to. And so God is setting up the camp, setting up the tabernacle, setting up the, how it's going to be taken care of. Cause they don't know any of it. They just built this thing. They don't know what God wants. And, uh, and so they're going to get this ready to go. And, and then in chapter 10, they're going to leave. It's a big deal when <clears throat> God comes and dwells in the midst of his people. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. you're right. The camp has to be ordered a certain way. And it's, it's especially important for us to understand it. It's why we've harped on it so much, because in the church, his spirit is in us. Yeah. His spirit is in me. His spirit is in you. Mm -hmm. His spirit's in Lee. His spirit's in all of us. And as we come together, Peter would say we're each a stone being built up into this this beautiful this beautiful temple for God. So, yeah. see, uh, the, see, people in the world have this perspective that, the, that they drive by a building and it's got a sign out front says such and such and such church. That that's a church. It's not a church. It's a building. It's that's brick right. and stone. Don't mean squat. It doesn't mean anything unless people are inside of it. Because the people are the church. That's right. And most people don't understand that. I never understood that. Right. You know. I mean. You know. I was. I was a part of a denominational world, and and the, and the church had a, a, a distinct significance to us. Well, it's and it's in in a lot of denominations, the area where, you know, I'm thinking like in Catholic in the Catholic denomination, they've got. Uh, the area where the priests stand that they call holy ground mm -hmm. because they have a tabernacle mm -hmm. and there's the bread and the wine in there and that's literally the body and the blood yep. of christ yep. and the, and uh, look i'm going to be quite frank the problem the whole problem with this this analogy mm -hmm. is you know let's set aside the literal body and blood for a second um you've ripped off from the old testament all of this theology which god says this is a shadow 
Mm. You know, this this was this was a copy. This wasn't the real thing. And what what they've done is they've recreated it. And so they they call this holy ground. And, and, the, and the significance of that is, they have you know, when you walk into, you know, when you walk into a Catholic church, you know, they've got holy water and you make sign of the cross because because that's the belief is that that's that the that actual body and blood of Jesus is up there. That that's actually where he's at. You know, which which uh, is Old Testament stuff, yes, but but it's not uh, it's not well. That's and they and you can see where they got that from, yeah. Because that here in Leviticus, what we've seen, well, before the priests come in, they have to they have to do a ceremonial washing and they have to put new garments on. They have to do all those things, and that dipping your water in and making the sign of the cross and doing all that is the uh, 21st century fast track, and it's been around for a long time. But it's the 21st century fast track to that. Yeah, that's I mean that's where they ripped it off from. Mm -hmm. It's not. That no, you don't find this done in the New Testament anywhere. No, nowhere in the Book of Acts do you see no. the church do this. And, and quite frankly, nowhere in church history do you really start seeing this happen until about three hundred. Yeah. So yeah, this was this was a later edition, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. Well, that's that's one of the reasons that I that I left. Right. Because because I was starting to read the book for myself, and 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 I couldn't line up what I was doing with what I was reading. Tr traditions, you know, Jesus said, it's not the things that we put into our body that defile us, but the things that come up out. Yeah. Me meaning in, in, intent matters, right? Um, certain traditions are going to form. We have traditions in the Church of Christ. Sure, we do. absolutely. We have man-made traditions. In some places, they're stronger than others, but we have we have man-made traditions, stuff that you don't see in the book, you know, how you, how you do this or how you do that, and, and we've chosen to do things that and, way. And people have fought and 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 alienate each other over them so yeah. i don't i don't think it's worth fighting over tradition i think what's important is why are you doing what you're doing and in well the, in one the, of the, the text that got me was you know that you're teaching for doctrine the commandments of men and that and that really you know that was the text i'm looking at and i said i can't get past well it. and that's and that's the entire that's my entire point right so their traditions, they bind on people, much like the Pharisees bound all of these traditions on these poor widows. And Jesus, what did Jesus do? He looked at them and condemned them for it. So that's the problem. But it's not just Catholics who do that. Baptists do it. People in the Church of Christ do it. Everybody does it. You know, it, not everybody, but a lot of people do it. And we shouldn't. You know, if we can look at the book, you know, this is why I, I always tell my Wednesday night class. You know, when you're looking at the book, God is very clear what sin is. Mm -hmm. He says it multiple times. There are lists yeah. in the New Testament that yeah. Paul wrote to the churches and said, look, if you behave this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah. Paul says, do this, 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 live this, pursue this, and you won't enter the kingdom of God. What we do is we come in and we add to those lists and call it sin. Shouldn't do that. No. When God says this is sin, that's sin. It's New Testament is clear. Lawlessness is sin. Doing something without faith is sin. Failing to do the good you ought to do is sin. Mm -hmm. Bible is very clear. That's sin. You live this way, you know, drunkenness, murdering, all those things. That's sin. You hate your brother or sister. That's sin. That's sin. These are all sins. In fact, what we often find in traditions is we're quicker to practice the work of the flesh and dissensions and factions than we are to practice forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. So... You know, we've got to be really, really clear. You know, I don't have a problem. If somebody wanted, if someone wants to dip their fingers in holy water and make the sign of the cross, I don't, my question is, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. What's the intent behind it? And are you going to bind it on somebody else? Mm -hmm. Those are my two questions. Because if, if your intent behind it is, well, I have to do this to enter in to the presence of Christ. No, you don't. You have a fundamental misunderstanding here. And I want you to embrace what Christ has given you freely, mm -hmm. right? Or if you're going to say, well, if I don't do this, I'm going to be subject to this, that, or other penalty. I want to help you understand, no, you don't. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, it, again, it all boils down to this. God cares. What we're seeing here in Numbers is God cares. God cares about his people. He wants to dwell in their midst. And there are certain obligations that that's going to incur. We've talked a lot about yeah. obedience. Mm -hmm. God's expectation is for the people to be obedient. In this time, mm -hmm. with this shadow, with this foreshadowing, this is what that obedience looked like. In the church, it looks different. Yeah. But he didn't leave us without recourse. He didn't leave us without being able to figure it out. It's very clear in the New Testament how he expects the church to live and function. And if you wanted to look at that, Lee, why don't you pull up Acts chapter 2, verse 42? Yeah. Let's Acts 2, 41 and 42. What was what was it that the church paid attention to? Let me jump over there real quick.
What did they devote themselves? You there? To... All right. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And to prayer. And to prayer. Mm -hmm. That's what they devoted themselves to. You know? What does it mean to be the church? That. Mm -hmm. This was the beginning of the church. This was as, as pure a fountain as you were going to get from the source. Mm -hmm. This is what it looked like. Where's, where's the tabernacle with the literal body and blood of Christ? Where's that? It's not in here. Where's the dipping of the water and the praying to Mary? You know, where in the in the in the Baptist well, traditions, I mean, what they do is they call it a they call it the sanctuary, mm -hmm. and they tell people to come to the altar, the stage the dude is standing on, the pastor is standing on a preaching. They altar call it the altar. Mm -hmm. Are you out of your mind? Yeah, yeah. You know, why are you doing what you're doing? I think this it's a question that we've got to ask. Call, they also call their preachers pastors, which is which is a is a complete misrepresentation of the word. Well. I, I would I would say that the way they use pastor and the way their pastors behave is less like a pastor ought. It's not right for a spiritual shepherd of the flock to pick up and leave his his flock every three years. Well, that's not right. You know when when you when you call every guy that stands in a pulpit a pastor, that is a misrepresentation of the word. I, I that is not likely. what the word means. It's yeah. not the way it was used in the New Testament at all. That's the way we've used yeah. it. You know, that's the way certain denominational worlds have used it. You know, in this in this instance, God is setting them up. He said, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do. That's right. You need to do it this way for a reason. He doesn't have to explain the reason. He just does it. He said, you do this or else. They already found out with Nadab and Abihu, if you don't, if the, what the or else is. They will find out here in little shortly what the or else is going to mean for for yeah. three thousand of them died at the hands of these Levites. That's why they're getting, that's why well, they're getting special again, treatment. It's not just... What you do, it's why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Nadab and Abihu entered into the presence of God mm -hmm. drunk. Yeah. Right? There was, a, there was a severe problem here. Yeah. They broke the covenant. Why? Because they don't trust God. Yeah. Right? And so we're going to see this over and over again. It's not just that they're doing the wrong thing. They're using the wrong... They have the wrong motive behind it as yep. well. Mm -hmm. And both of those things are going to come again. If you have the wrong motive, you're never going to do the right thing. Yeah. Let's just be, let's be really clear. Yep. You're always going to be mm -hmm. messing up. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's going on here in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. They're getting the tabernacle ready. They're setting apart the Levites. They're anointing yep. the altar. They're doing all those things. Mm -hmm. But we're going to pick it up in 9 because something really interesting happens in chapter 9 and that we want to talk about. We've talked about it a little bit before. Well, we, we, we dealt with it in the book of, book of Leviticus. We did. I mean, we they, talk, we he, talked set, about he set up this Passover as an annual reminder of what he did in, in Exodus, what he did before they came out. The last plague right. was the death of the firstborn. And he's made it really clear. He said, this is who can take of it. This is who can't take of it. This is when you can take of it. And this is when you can't take and of it. And just a reminder, this is extremely important to us because Jesus was our Passover lamb. That's right. Jesus was the fulfillment of this whole event. He was the fulfillment of it. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he became that Passover lamb that not only not only blotted out sin, took away sin, made, yeah. they made removal of sin possible, made purification possible, made justification and sanctification possible only through Jesus. And that's he was that Passover. So when, when every time you see this, guys, and you're looking at the Passover, understand what's coming. What's coming years later, what's coming right. is Jesus hanging on a cross. You know, that's what's coming. So let's get into it. This is uh, Numbers 9, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they'd come out of Egypt. So you have a time stamp there. Mm -hmm. We're still at the foot of Sinai. Mm -hmm. They've been here for two years, right? Yep. The first uh -huh. month of the second year. So they've been here a year, mm -hmm. and this is this going on the second year. So they've been there 13 months, right? Yep. So after they came out of Egypt, he said, have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. So it's Pat's Passover time is coming. Celebrated at the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of this month in accordance. Yeah, it's, it was the 14th of the first month. Yeah. Right? Okay. Celebrate it. Look at what he says here. At the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of the month in accordance with all its rules and regulations. I done told you how to do this already. Mm -hmm. Now do it. That's mm -hmm. what God's saying. Yeah. Okay. So Moses told the Israelites to celebrate the Passover, and they did so in the desert of Sinai at the twilight, at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. It's very important. But some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day because they were ceremonially unclean. Now, what does that mean if they don't celebrate the Passover? Well, to God, it was extremely important for them to do this, right? You know, for... You know, it, it means, you know, they, uh, uh, they're they not going to be involved with what the rest of the, rest of the, rest of the flock's doing. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I recall, mm 
if you don't celebrate the Passover, you're cut off from the Yeah, people. you have to be cut off. You're yeah. cut out. Yeah, you cut off. You're, yeah. you're, sh- you're shot. Yeah. Okay. So some of them could not celebrate Because the God Passover. makes it very easy for them to do this. All the cleansing things, everything that needs to be done. If they do that, God's going to accept their their worship. This is part of their worship. That's right. Okay. It actually. So a lot of people think, and I, as you comment talking about their worship, the Israelites worshipped. The structured worship of the Israelites was three times a year at these feasts. Mm-hmm. That's when they came to the temple mm-hmm. and they all together mm-hmm. worshipped. Yeah. They didn't. They worshipped on the Sabbath, but it wasn't like what we're no. what we're doing now. What. What the Sabbath was was supposed to be a day of rest. Yeah, it's not about worship per se; it's about well, rest. For, if you understand what worship is, yeah, worship is not an event. Okay, we made it into an event. There you go. Yes, and and some places make it more more uh, of an event than other places. It's supposed to be your life, and, and that's what the word actually. Jesus uses the word for worship. Two different words in a text. I think in Matthew chapter four, and he said when he's when he's dealing with Satan in the in the in the wilderness and he's hungry, and he says he says uh, you're supposed to worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Both those words are worship. Yeah. One of them means one thing. One of them means something else. That's right. Jesus said you're supposed to worship ceremonially and you're supposed to worship on a regular daily basis. That's serve. You know that attitude of service. So I, I think the two words there are uh, proskuneo and latreo. Mm-hmm. And so they're Greek words, and and the and they the point, mean one of them means, a, one of them means to bow down. Yeah, one of them the means, only yeah. time you see that word in the New Testament being used by the church. The only time you see it is not on Sunday. The only time you see it is in the presence of the resurrected and glorified. But it's Lord. Where, where the translators translated worship. They did. You don't get the same intensity of it when you translate it worship. Okay, it's, it it now it means to prostrate. It means now to I can do anything I want because it's well, this is worship. You know, I can I can have a bunch of of, of uh, you know uh, scantily clad girls up on stage during uh, whatever you know and jumping around and singing a Jesus song and say, well, that's worship. No, but but that's what, the, what we that's what we've done. Yeah, we've made so we've taken we've taken the meaning out of it and made it an event. And and I tell people all the time. I used to tell my boys when we when we eat our meal on Saturday. You know, in the evening, we always ate together, and uh, and I, and we would pray. And I say, and I'd always pray every every Saturday, Father, get us ready to worship you in the morning, get us ready to serve you in the morning, you know. And I'd always tell the guys, said guys, th- we're not going to church, we're going to worship, we're going yeah. to stand before God and honor and glorify Him. I said, we're the, that's not the church. We're the church. We're not going to church. Sorry, we're going to worship. And, and you know, the mindset of, of people when you start telling them, it's that, what are you talking about? You know, the church is down there. You know, well, I, when we were talking about Catholicism, I used to worship right down here. And I'd make the sign of the cross when I drive by. When I drive by the building, I made the sign of the cross. Because that's what you're supposed to do because that place is holy. No, it's not. No, it's not. Stop. We turn this into an event, so we have to make the place holy that we're going to have the event in, so it's special and God accepts it from and our that, perspective. And that goes all the way back. That's, oh. that's that goes all that's that's exactly how Mary ended up becoming Absolute, deified and absolutely, worshipped. Absolutely. Because essentially what they said was, well, Jesus was perfect. He they she can't he came from Mary, so she's, she's gotta, be gotta be perfect too. Mm-hmm. She's got to be holy. And the ridiculousness of this statement, it's like, well, so how far back? I mean, Mary was flesh and blood too. So how did she become perfect? And that's that's essentially the debate. And that, that happened very early yeah. in the church, three, yeah. 400 AD. Yeah. Th- those were the debates that mm-hmm. were going on. And what it really is, is a debate about Greek philosophy. Mm-hmm. Because in Greek philosophy, the flesh, the physical, uh, physical manifestations, all these things are evil and wicked and Gnosticism. sinful. And it was, it was, called, it was in, in one, at some point, there, there was a, a term called Gnosticism. And it was a, it was an idea of well, the Greeks that, yeah. that the, the smarter I got, the closer I got to heaven. So this this Greek philosophy influenced that as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it, the reason that all these things happened mm-hmm. is, is because very early on in the church, they brought things that weren't Christian into yeah. the church because people who weren't Christian were becoming Christian and bringing them into the church. And, and, we, and, and they turned worship into an event. That's right. Instead of making it what God wanted it to be, you know, that, like I said, you know, that 
they didn't they didn't worship like that on Saturday. They there was a day of rest. That's right. Their worship was every single day. Now when the temple was destroyed, that's when you had the synagogues start coming into play. That's when there was more emphasis placed on the Sabbath because the temple had been destroyed. And they started they started making it into an event. That's right. Yeah. But absolutely. Jesus didn't condemn it. No, no. He didn't condemn it. You know, he went to the synagogues. He went he and prayed with them. He went, and, and some of the most powerful things that happened in the Gospels is when Jesus said, you, this, this uh, scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What? They, they lost their minds. Yep. They lost their minds because he's saying, that he's talking about me. That's right. You know, but he used their event when they were when they were selling animals and stuff and making money, he went in there. What did he do? Took a whip in a chair and cleaned house, man. Well, and and you know, they turned worship into an event. Even in the Old Testament, you know, the they were cheating God with their sacrifices and cheating God with their gifts. And you know, Amos would say, "All of your sacrifices and all this stuff are disgusting. I spit them out, of vomiting well, out from my mouth because the heart wasn't there." You know, it scares me because. Because we it so easily could turn worship into an event. Well, when we turn it in, when we turn it, when we turn worship to be about us, mm -hmm. that's the problem. It's it comes back to the intent, the heart. Well, where, where where what is it that we want? Do we want to be entertained? Is that what we're well, looking for? Think that, yeah, thank you. You said that because there was a point in time here that there was a, a push that we need to entertain them, and and that and and that was told to me. We need to entertain them. And I said, wait a minute, worship's not about entertainment. Yeah, no. That that opens up a whole can of worms. Everything we do in the assembly on Sunday is about glorifying God. Absolutely. When you live your life in such a way, whether it be here in the assembly on Sunday morning or Monday through but Saturday. Cole, you know yourself, people have an an, an idea of what that must supposed to well, look, look like. Dan, we've got ideas about lots of things, but that's why when you show up on Sunday, we're going to be preaching and we're going to be preaching and teaching out of the book. Because you know what? I don't really care what your idea is. I but, really but don't. You, but you understand that most people in the world, most and, and sometimes people, you know, that, that it has to be reverent. We have to have a reverent word. Well, and we that's, turn a, it, that's and, a cultural thing. And, that but, really is a cultural thing, man. I mean, you go, look, you go to Africa and you go sit down in a, in a, in a church of Christ in Africa and you see how they worship. It's a different ballgame. Yeah, it's different. It ain't. Hey, you ain't going to be done in an hour. Yeah, you ain't going to be done. You ain't going to be done for five hours. Yeah, six hours, seven hours. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. It's in, in our culture. We have turned it in. It, and it's in our culture. Understand our culture, especially in the United States, is a byproduct of a lot of the culture that came over from from Europe. And so we we've turned worship into this very reverent thing. No, no. We turned it into rigor mortis. Some places. Yeah. No, uh, Instant. Uh, Forget the, the, the collective. Mm -hmm. In individuals' lives, we've turned it into rigor mortis. There, you're absolutely right. There are brothers and sisters who've turned, who've turned the desire to be reverent into rigor mortis and death. You're, yeah. I, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I have to sit there like this. Right. You know, I can't, you know, and, and God help me if I look this way or this way. You know, that that's not, yeah, I like it here. But the problem isn't. The problem isn't the desire to be reverent, and that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the desire to be reverent before our God is not a bad thing. No, it's, it's not. It's been it's taken not. too far Absolutely. in some cases. I, I mean, I'm not going to get up there, you know. For me, I'm not going to. I'm not getting behind that microphone with a pair of shorts and a tank top on. Sure, not going to happen. Now, do I need to wear a suit to be reverent? No, no. But I choose to do that. I'm not going to fault you if you don't want. Fine. But I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to wear a suit and a tie on Wednesday night because it's a different dynamic. Yeah. The the worship of it is different. It's more laid back. It's just a. It's more Bible study. It's still worship. Yeah. You know the the problem is I think I think for the most part we have a handle on it here. I think for the most part most people here have a handle on it. This this really boils back down to these traditions that we talked about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We're all going to, you're, you're going to form tradition. It yeah. doesn't matter what, what yeah. you do because you're yeah. going to read this book and you're going to try to put these things into practice. And when you do that, you form a little bit of tradition. Mm -hmm. What we're required to do is take a step back and go, okay, well, wait a minute. 
what does the book say? What is the expectation here? For example, the expectation is that we gather on Sunday. Yeah. That's very clear. The church mm-hmm. gathered on the day yes, that the did. Lord yes, raised. Mm-hmm. So he, he came yeah. and he appeared before the apostles on Sunday. The expectation and, and is that obvious, we gather on Sunday. And it Sunday. was obvious that at least on that day, they did take the Lord's Supper. That's right. Now so, that it, but we've relegated it to only that day. Well, and, and that necessarily what it's saying. So we know that they gathered on Sunday, mm-hmm. but what did they do on Sunday? And how did all that work? And there's, and how do you have two songs for communion, three songs for communion? You know, all the book says is in First Corinthians is that it ought to be order. When you gather together, there ought to be an order. Mm-hmm. So. Two songs, three songs, that's really up uh, that's up in the air. You know, however many songs you want to do, mm-hmm. that's that's really not you see what I'm saying? You've got to take a step back. The important thing is that we're gathering to encourage one another. The important thing is that we're gathering to be instructed in the word of the Lord. The important thing is that we're gathering together in such a way that brings glory and honor to God. That's the important thing. Mm-hmm. The rest of this stuff, hey man, they can change. Yeah. It's okay. And, Does but, it have to be know, pews the, or chairs for, or you know? For, we got chasing some rabbits out there. Uh, we did big time. But but this for what he's what they're saying is, you know, there was a celebration of Passover that was demanded. And you know what? But this is gonna prove the point. Let's, okay. This is going to okay. cap it off, right. right? But some of them could not celebrate the Passover on the day because they were ceremonially unclean on account of a dead body. Well, if they can't take the Passover, they're cut off from the people. That's what the that's what God has already told them. So now they're unclean and they can't take the Passover because they're unclean. So they came to Moses and Aaron that same day and said to Moses, we've become unclean because of dead body, but why should we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering with the other Israelites at the appointed time? And so Moses looked at him and said, you unhealthy pagans, no. God already said something. God already saying. laid down the law. He already told us that if you're unclean, you can't take it. I guess you just didn't try hard enough. I don't care if your mama died in your arms. It doesn't make a difference. Mm. The word of the Lord says this. That's what he said, right? No. And they're cut off from their people and he throws them out. No. Wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. God already spoke, though. Mm. He already commanded. Mm. So why are we going back to the Lord to get another command? I think, you know, we've talked about this before, and I don't want to, I don't want to belabor it much, but I think these guys were literally trying to do God's will. Okay. And, mm-hmm. and something happened in their life outside of their control. And, and they, by law, they could not take the, take the Passover. The law so, God already spoke. And, and so, so Moses goes to them and, but these, these guys don't know their, each other's hearts. Only God would. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And and that's what he's saying. He it wasn't so much about the sacrifice, but he did require them to take of this thing, so he's going to change it up for them. What I'm what I'm saying is I think he's going to make it more clear for them. The way we commonly use the law of Moses, the way you see people exposit it mm-hmm. and interpret it. I mean, there's a movement of Christians today that say this is the perfect law. And until everybody comes back and starts following, how perfect could it be? They're not even out of Sinai, and God's already changing part of it. They're not even out of Sinai yet, and God's already changing it. But look at what he. But look at how he changed it. I understand. He said. He said, "Fine." He said, "Then do it next month." Then do it next month. Yeah. Wow. But what was the heart? But he what gave them the that opportunity to do it next month because of maybe under circumstances that were not under their control. The problem: people are going to screw this up. All right, we always do. We already talked about that. But if you if you're doing God's work and you come in contact with a dead body, and you have to you have to eradicate the body out of the camp. For whatever reason, or you're on a on a on a mission that God has sent you on, and you can't take it because you're not with the body, and you can't take it to the tabernacle, then God says, "Then do it next month." You know the the I think one of the clearest ways that that we can look at this in the new t- New Testament New Covenant is we, we've been talking about, which is Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. When do we take the Lord's Supper? We take it on Sunday morning. I, you know, I take. You know how many times I take it on Sunday morning? Depends on if I'm visiting. Mm-hmm. I'll take it multiple times. Mm-hmm. I'll take it with the body here. And then when I go visit my brothers and sisters who can't be here, I'll take it again with them. Mm-hmm. If somebody comes in Friday night mm-hmm. or Sunday night mm-hmm. and I was here, I'd take it again with them. Mm-hmm. Why? Because what are we doing? We're participating in we, the Lord's we, uh, table we talked together about that. as fellowship. We talked about that in, in, the, uh, in our small group. And we had some people that were that came, sometimes couldn't come, and they and they took <laughs> And I just asked the group, I said, I said, are you, do you have a problem we, if we take it with them? You know, and some did and some didn't. Well, and this is my point. Do you have to take the Lord's Supper on Sunday? No, you don't. No. Because Paul says, you got to examine the body. 
And if we're not all together in this thing, if we're not all working together, for example, you got one brother, you got brothers and you got a brother over here and a brother over here and they ain't talked in 30 years and they're not going to talk because this one hates this one. Guess what? You're not all on the same page. And if everybody knows that, this is a fractured body. Nobody should be taking communion mm -hmm. if everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's Billy Bob. Billy Bob don't sit with Billy Joel anymore. Well, why not? Because, well, Billy Bob and Billy Joel had a fallout 30 years ago, and now none of it. That's ridiculous, man. Yeah. And you're all still taking communion? Yeah. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. You want to talk about blasphemy before the Lord? Mm -hmm. It doesn't get much stronger than that. Yeah. You see, but you see the problem? Mm -hmm. We've you've we've turned it into the event. We have to take mm -hmm. communion on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Paul says, if you're not right with God, if you're not living the way you ought to, in fellowship with all your brothers and sisters, that's the way that means. It doesn't mean examine myself and make sure I don't have any sin. That's not what he's talking about there. That ain't ever gonna happen. Yeah. First person who says they're without sin is a liar, and the truth isn't in them. Yeah. So that's not the issue. Mm -hmm. What's the issue? Am I in fellowship with my brother and sister? And, and we have, there, I know of, of one or two that don't take the Lord's Supper uh, because of because of things in their life that they are that they have not gotten a handle on. And I applaud them for that. You know, I, I wish they would. And uh, and, uh, and we're praying for them that uh, and I know other people that are working with them. I don't have to work with them because somebody else is working with one of them. But it's a misunderstanding. I think you're right. And, uh, it's, but it's but I don't know. But I don't know that person's heart. Just like Moses didn't know these people's heart, you know, and God did. And God said, the okay. person who says I'm not good enough mm -hmm. to take communion is misunderstanding. Yes, that, the that's true. Of Christ but I don't know. Christ. I don't know what's going on in that person's life on a daily basis that maybe not is, is lined up with God. Yeah. What and I'm we have a bigger is, problem here than that. What I'm saying is to bring it more in line with what Paul was talking about then, ideally, none of us would take it on Sunday but, because but one of us doesn't. What, what I'm saying is, is if... All your worship is what people see on Sunday morning and every other time. I understand why you're not well, taking yeah, that. that, that, that. Yeah, that's that. But I don't know yeah. a person's heart. Moses didn't know these people's hearts. He didn't know. God did. And God said, you're right. Take it next month. It'll be fine for you. But he's going to clarify it, too. He said, he said and I mean, we'll have to finish it next week because we're already running out of time, but I'm going to have to go. But, but uh, you know, but it's there's a there's a point. Well, just look at it. And he said, he said, uh, uh, he said, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, when any of you or your descendants are unclean because of a dead body or away on a journey, they are to still to celebrate the Lord's Supper, but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month at twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and burnt bitter herbs. They must not leave any of it till morning. And it goes on. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. But if anyone who is ceremonially unclean and not on a journey fails to celebrate the Passover, they must be cut off from their people for not presenting the Lord's offering at the proper time. They will bear the consequence of their sin. That is sin. The other's not, according to God. Because God knows their heart. And God, he said, if you're not on anywhere and you just choose not to take it, then that's, that's different. sin. That's different. But how often, how often as the Lord's people, do we fail to make ex exceptions for things where we ought. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. The, I'm, Lord, yeah. the Lord put in an exception for these people. Yeah. Yeah. He did. He changed his law. He did. For this people. Yeah. Because their motive and their heart was right. Yeah. And he says he desires mercy, not, not sacrifice. He desires, he desires a clean and pure heart. That's what he's bringing with Jesus. A clean and pure heart. We're not talking about people. We're not talking. And he makes it clear. You know, if, if someone just doesn't care then that's not okay. Yeah. But that's not what happened. No. You know, it doesn't say anywhere in here that these people came in contact with the dead body because of their job. It doesn't say that. It mm -hmm. just says they came in contact with the dead body and now they're ceremonially unclean and they can't take the Passover. But it's bothering them. It is. It's obviously See, bothering them. That, but he desires He desires that that tenderness of heart. Yeah. He desires that 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 uh, sensitivity of heart. What, what we desires. do matters. Yeah. But the intent also and it can turn our desire, if our intent is wrong, it can turn our he, desire he wrong. He is looking for a pure and clean heart. That's what he's looking he for. He told the woman at the well, the true worshipers of God will worship him in spirit and, and in truth. truth. Yep. Yep. Well, it took us all, the whole class, to get through that little part. Well, we did get to chapter 9. But this is an important, this yeah, is a is. really important, important section. It is important. Because it and, once and again. And we will touch on it again. It's going to come up again. In, in, it's in, going to come up again. In it's going to come up again. It demonstrates the intent of the law. The yeah. whole purpose of the law was, as Paul would say, was to increase sin and make our need of Christ known.
And, and that it, it and says in Galatians that, that it, it is a school teacher to bring us to Christ. That's right. That's what it's there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the power of the word. We thank you, Father, for your love and your debt and your commitment to us. We pray, Father, that you're a, a thanksgiving for grace and mercy and uh, father we we know that we that we are uh we we fail many times in our understanding and our application and we pray father your patience and your kindness as we as we strive to navigate and and strive to understand and then make application in our lives father help us as we go as we move forward thank you for the opportunities and thank you especially for your son it's in his name that we pray amen amen